So uh, please uh, go ahead, eat. It's a Jewish event, so you must eat. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be with you tonight. I will want to really take this opportunity that we have with so many of you uh, involved on campus, coming from so many backgrounds. Just a second, is there something kind of done about this? I think it's the water. It's a okay, sorry. Um, so uh, I want to take this opportunity to tell you about Israel. I have been born and raised in Israel. The English accent is a happy accident. As uh, my father did a postdoc uh, in the United States when I was in fourth and fifth grade. So it's a good time for a kid to learn a language and get the accent. But other than that, uh, completely Israeli, born and raised in Israel and Jerusalem my entire life and living today in Tel Aviv. So what I would like to do with you this evening is to give you a few ideas about what is Israel. You've spoken about what you, why you care about Israel, why Israel is interesting to you, why the Israeli-American relationship is important to you. And many of you are knowledgeable about Israel. But what I find with many people who visit Israel is that Israel is a place about which many people have passionately held views and opinions, but so few people actually know the country and know the people and know what it's all about. So I want to tell you one thing that I think is the most important thing to understand Israel. And to understand Israel, you need to know that Israel was first and foremost born here. Israel was born in people's minds and imaginations. It was a vision long before it became a reality. That makes it one of the world's unique countries. Because it was planned. It was envisioned. One of its early visionaries, Theodore Herzl, actually wrote a manual about how to go about creating that country. And we are in many ways living out his plan. Now the fact that Israel was born out of people's minds and visions and ideas is one of its greatest strengths, but also great vulnerability. It's a great strength of Israel because we are all in Israel heirs to people who made the impossible possible. The entrepreneurial spirit of Israel is not just about high tech. It's about the fact that we have seen that it is possible to take a truly insane idea. The idea that after 2,000 years of exile, the Jewish people will return to reclaim their homeland to build a sovereign state and to actually take that insane idea and turn it into a thriving reality. We are all heirs to that and think how powerful it is to be heirs to that. Now, th this is really, I uh, mean, many of you probably had a chance to participate over the years in a Passover Seder. The idea of Israel was not new. Do you know what you say at the end of a Passover Seder? What Jews have said for centuries, whether they lived in Poland or Morocco, next year in Jerusalem. So for centuries, Jews spoke about next year in Jerusalem, Zion, the other name for Jerusalem. But they never actually thought it was gonna happen. They thought that maybe one day the Messiah will come and take them to their homeland. But they didn't literally think it was going to be next year in Jerusalem. And that's what Zionism did. And that's what Zionism is such a thoroughly modern movement. And that is why America gets Zionism in Israel better than any country in the world. Because the early Zionist thinkers and leaders said, we're no longer waiting for the Messiah. We're going to be our own Messiah. We're going to take fate into our own hands. We are no longer, we're no longer going to accept our status as second class subjects 
a persecuted minority among the host nations. We will take faith into our own hands. We will be our own Messiah. We will take ourselves back to our homeland and we will build a state. And this is a truly inspiring idea, was considered insane at the time, and we are all heirs to the people who have made it a reality. It is also a great vulnerability of Israel because I would argue that three quarters of the world's countries make less sense than Israel in terms of coherence of land and people and civilization and language and territory. And yet Israel is the only country that is being attacked and questioned for its foundational idea. The idea that the Jewish people, as a people, have a right to self-determination in their own homeland. There are people who still question and attack that very idea. So this is, I think, the first and most important thing to know about Israel. It was first and foremost an idea, and we are the heirs to the people who made it a reality. It is our strength, but it is also our vulnerability, and we continuously are asked to defend it still. The other thing that I want you to know about Israel, and emerges directly from the first, is that it is, Israel is an immigrant country. And you will, another reason why America tends to get Israel more than other countries in the world. <coughs> now why is Israel an immigrant country? Typically small countries are not immigrant countries. They were the descendants of the original exiles from the first century, the second century. So Aliyah, in Hebrew, means ascendance. Aliyah is a key idea in Zionism. It's the idea of immigrating to the Holy Land. And it's called Aliyah, it comes from the biblical term of ascending to the Temple Mount. Because the notion is that if you immigrate to Israel, you somehow ascend. Now this is again a source of strength for Israel, but also quite a challenge. As an immigrant country, especially also here in Texas, you will recognize that immigration is a strength. It is responsible for a diversity and an energy that you, for those of you who have visited Israel, you will experience. Jews have come to Israel from literally every country in the world, bringing different cultures and different uh, colors and different cultures and different languages, and have all become a people, speaking a new and revived language, the Hebrew language, and that is a remarkable achievement. Sometimes when I speak to young people in Israel, I do a little exercise. I ask them, for those of you born in Israel, and for those of you whose parents, if not born in Israel, married in Israel, how many have four grandparents from the same ethnic background? In a room of 200, I will see three or four hands raised. And that is in the space of two or three generations. So Israel is a remarkable, successful story of immigration and integration and getting everyone mixed up. But it's also a challenge, and you will recognize it from here too. There's a phrase that we say in Hebrew, that in Israel we very much like Aliyah, we very much like immigration, without it the country would not have come into being, but not so much the Oli, not so much the immigrants. So the idea of immigration is great. The immigrants themselves were their problem. The, and again, even though almost all Jews in Israel will be immigrants or descendants of immigrants. And the reason is, of course, that every immigrant country has challenges and problems. In Israel, some people talk about it in ethnic terms, but I think it's the wrong way to think about it. It's more about a question of who came first and who came later. You know how it is. Those who come first 
They establish the rules, they bake the pie. Then another wave comes. And initially they play by the rules. They take whatever share of the pie they're given and they say thank you. But after a while they start to feel at home, right? Because the whole idea of an immigrant nation is that immigrants are supposed to start to feel at home at one point. What do you do when you feel at home? You kind of want to rearrange the furniture at one point. <coughs> so the new wave begins to, and they're no longer new anymore, they say, we don't like the rules anymore. We want new rules. And we, we think we should get a bigger share of the pie. Well, what do those who have come earlier say? Hold it. You should say thank you. And these are our rules. And we've built this place. So I would say that the challenges in Israel are very much the challenges of an immigrant society that despite its tremendous success and integration, still has to deal with many, many challenges that come from the tensions between these successive waves of immigrant groups. Now the third thing that I'd like you to know about Israel, and that is by far the most difficult thing to understand, and I would say that almost no one gets it, is what does it actually mean to be the Jewish state? It is by far the most <laughs> misunderstood idea there is. Especially in America, you think of Jewish as being religious. America is a religious country. But that is absolutely not a necessary definition. Judaism is an ancient civilization. Being Jewish, especially in modern times, has many, many meanings. It doesn't even have to be religious. I have a friend who says that in order to understand the Jewish relationship to God, you need to understand that in Judaism you can believe in one God or less. So, Judaism has a long and complicated relationship. Judaism is, I think, better understood as a civilization rather than a religion. And an ancient civilization, one of the world's most ancient civilizations. And my best definition of what a Jewish country is and what it means to be the Jewish state is the following. After much thought, I've arrived at the following definition. That the Jewish state is the one state in the world where we can argue about what it means to be the Jewish state. <laughs> and the reason that I've come at this definition is that this is precisely what we do in Israel and around the world for all those who care about Israel. There are those who want to promote a religious vision of the state. There are those who want to promote an exclusivist uh, vision of the state. There are those who want to promote an inclusive vision of the state. And there are those who have a secular vision of the state. And they are all equally Jewish. They are all steeped in Jewish civilization and history and text. Let me bring you an example from recent times to give you a sense of the debate. Recently, uh, a senior Jewish uh, a minister who is religious, uh, Jewish religious, said in an interview to a newspaper when asked about uh, the rights of gay parents to a family. In Israel, uh, there's a lot of support. Uh, in my child's kindergarten, we have uh, three gay parents with children. As I'm sure you know, uh, in Judaism, uh, it's really more about having children. Uh, so it's very interesting. I think gays have been far more accepted in Israeli society as soon as it became clear that they can have children. So now that we know that they can have children, people are much more cool about it. So. The grandparents are happy, everyone's happy. So, um, this minister in a, in a conservative Jewish paper uh, was asked about it, and he said that he feels that in the Jewish state, gay parents with children should not be thought of as family. This created a huge fur, called for his resignation, attacks on his Facebook page. 
the interesting thing that those who opposed him said, in the Jewish state, we should precisely call and gay parents with children as family because they are going above and beyond the call of duty to have a family, which is a Jewish value. So what's interesting about this debate is that both sides of it talked about the Jewish state. So it gives you a sense of the extent to which this is not firm, not defined, and hotly debated. But the important thing is to understand that all the Jewish people are asking that they have one place in the world where they can engage in this debate for the next 400 years or so without no one kind of interfering with their ability to figure out what it means to be the Jewish state. Now, I've discussed things that have to do with Israel and the Jewish people and Zionism. But obviously, a lot of the interest, concern, debate around Israel is around the conflict. So I want to say a few words about Jewish-Arab relations within Israel and the conflict more broadly. Now, few people are aware, because Israel is so often referred to as the Jewish state, that Israel has the largest Muslim minority in the world, percentage-wise. It's a little known fact. Israel has nearly a 20% Muslim Arab minority. Uh, the only countries in the world that have large Muslim minorities, and no one not is even close to 20%, are countries like India or France or Russia, of course, the absolute numbers are much larger. But in percentage terms, Israel is by far the country with the largest Muslim minority in the world. And that is a little known fact. Now, how are there Arab Muslims within Israel? Uh, and the story, of course, and I will not go through the entire history of the conflict, but as Jews began to immigrate to the land of Israel, inspired by the vision of Zionism of establishing a modern sovereign state in their ancient homeland, as they began that process, they began to enter into clashes with the local population who was developing at the time its own sense of Arab national identity. And these smaller local clashes turned over time, over decades, into a fierce conflict between two national movements, the Zionist movement, the movement for a Jewish national sovereign land, and the Arab national movement. And they were in conflict and had conflicting goals. Uh, as the United Nations decided uh, I'll say two words just to how we got into the United Nations. This was an area of the Ottoman Empire. World War I, the victorious powers, France and Britain, carve up the Ottoman Empire to many countries that are now being disintegrating Syria, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, and what they call the Mandate for Palestine where Britain is asked by the League of Nations to help the Jewish people achieve national sovereignty. Britain governs the area for 26 years. After World War II says we can't manage it anymore, the Jews and the Arabs are in too intense a conflict. United Nations, heir to the League of Nations, we're giving you back the mandate, you decide what to do. The Arabs say, uh, sorry, they say unhappily yes, they think they should get the entire state, but they still want to stay. The Arabs say no. From their perspective, the Jewish people should not be there. War ensues. Ceasefire lines are established. And the new state of Israel is declared. Within the ceasefire lines, there is a substantial Muslim Arab minority. Now think about them. They did not dream of that state. They did not envision it. They did not want it. And they fought against it. But they wake up the next morning, and they are citizens of that state. 
What are they going to do? From that moment, you find two opposing responses, sometimes in the same person. One says, Israel is a democracy, it's open, it's a good enough country, certainly in the Middle East. We need to make sure that we fight for our rights. For this, they have the sympathy of the Jewish majority. But then another response says, we will never truly feel that we belong until this ceases to be the Jewish state, whatever that means, until it strips itself of every symbol that connects it to Jewish history and tradition and civilization, and only then we will feel that we belong. And to that, the Jewish majority says no. We have not fought for that. So Jewish-Arab relations within Israel are very complex. There's often criticism of them, but I sometimes think we need to take a step back and to realize that it's almost a miracle that they're not Jewish. I have an Arab colleague who says that to understand Jewish-Arab relations within Israel, you need to understand that in Israel, the Jews are the numerical majority, but in their minds, they're the minority. And the Arabs are the numerical minority, but in their minds, they're the majority. Now, when you zoom out to the entire Middle East, that's actually the situation. The Jews are 6 million among 300 million Arabs. But it's also a matter of mentality, of how we think about ourselves. The Jews have been a minority for nearly 2,000 years. We have gotten used to that. We have built the institutions, the mode of thinking of being a minority, typically a marginalized, subjugated, persecuted minority. Being a majority is a whole new business to us and requires adjustment. And for the Arabs being the only minority in the Middle East, everywhere else, they're a majority, typically 100% majority. To be the only Arab minority in the Middle East is an unfamiliar and humiliating experience. And that, in many ways, shapes the relationship. And finally, I want to end with a thought about the broader conflict between Israel and the Arab world, and within that, the Palestinians. And here I just want to ask one question. What is the conflict about? What are we fighting over? And when I, I want to share a story with you. I grew up very much in what is called the left wing of Israeli politics. Those who support peace those who support what is known as the two-state solution, those who support the emergence of a Palestinian state as the national self-expression of the Arab people in the land. And as someone who comes from that side of politics, I was often invited as a young leader to meet with moderate Palestinian leaders. And in those meetings, I realized that their moderation came from the fact that they accepted reality, that they accepted the existence of Israel, that they accepted that Israel is powerful and therefore that they have to come to terms with it. But then after dinner, we would have discussions and they would say things to me like, the Jewish people are not a people. You're only a religion. And I'm certainly not religious, but I'm very committed to the Jewish people. So they would say, you're not, a you're not a people, you're only a religion. And religions don't have the right to have their own state. They don't have the right to self-determination. And your connection to the land, that's a made up story. You have taken a foreign land. It is not yours. And I would go home from these meetings deeply troubled and thinking, these are the moderates. And if these are the moderates, <coughs> does this mean that what I, I was told as a member of the left, that this conflict is about settlements and occupation, 
Could it be about something much bigger, much deeper? About the fact that there's no recognition of the right, not the might, the right of the Jewish people to national self-expression in their homeland. Not a superior right, not an exclusive right, but an equal right. That there's no recognition of that. And this really had a lot of impact on my thinking as to whether peace is really possible if this right is not recognized. And I began to seek Palestinians on the other side who would recognize this right, just as I recognized the right of the Arab Palestinians to national self-expression in the land. Not the exclusive right, not the superior right, but the equal right. And for a very long time, I found no one. Even the organizer of those meetings tried to find people for me. And I finally decided to write an article about this. And just before I was about to publish the article, the organizer of these meetings put me in contact with a graduate of this university, Professor Muhammad Dujani. He did his PhD here, used to be uh, a very uh, radical Palestinian activist. He has recently become fairly well known uh, when he took his students to an educational study tour in Auschwitz and over that lost his job as the head of the American Studies Department in Al-Quds University, a Palestinian university in East Jerusalem. And he told me that he will sign on to me on a mutual declaration of recognition of rights, which we wrote together and said the following. The Jewish people around the world and the Palestinian people around the world are both indigenous to the land of Israel slash Palestine. They both have the right to return and to settle anywhere in the land. But given their respectively different national histories, cultures, languages, religions, they accept that peace will come through the creation of a Jewish state, Israel, and an Arab state, Palestine, and neither can be exclusive. Both should accommodate minorities of the other people. So we penned this joint declaration, and I was able to put it into my article. And he is a very unique person. And his stance is sadly still not very popular among his people, as his story suggests. And he requires tremendous courage to say what he says. I don't need to be courageous to recognize the right of the Palestinian people to national self-expression in the land. He needs to be very courageous to accept the rights of the Jewish people. But he exists, and he should be encouraged, and he's a graduate of this university. So on this hopeful note, I want to end this and to say that I don't know that peace is around the corner. But if peace will be achieved one day, it will only be achieved through the mutual recognition that in this land there are two peoples for which this land is dear, and only by mutually recognizing the rights of both of them to the land can we finally have peace. Thank you very much.